Neuland, the HPI podcast. With digital transformation, we are entering a whole new world. From the power of artificial intelligence to blockchain and hate speech and social media. Experts from the Hasso Plattner Institute talk about the risks and opportunities of digitization in this podcast series. Welcome to this episode. My name is Leon Stebe. Today we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence and energy and how do both belong together. AI systems are deployed across an ever-growing number of domains. We see that some people regard AI as an all-purpose tool in the fight against global challenges such as climate change. At the same time, we see a sharp increase in energy consumption of AI algorithms as well. Together with my two guests, we want to look at the bigger picture now. Professor Ralf Herbrich is an internationally renowned AI expert. He has already worked with AI in big tech companies such as Amazon and Zalando. Currently, he is managing director of the Hasso Plattner Institute here in Potsdam and chair of the newly established Department for AI and Sustainability. So that's your first appearance here in our podcast show. Welcome to Neuland. Thank you for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Williamson. He is another pioneer and expert in the field of AI. He has worked at the National University in Canberra, Australia for many years. Since 2020, he is Professor for Foundations of Machine Learning Systems at the Eberhard Karls University Tübingen in the south of Germany. And it's great to have you on the show as well. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Mr. Herbrich, let me start with a basic question. A lot of people are talking about artificial intelligence these days, but the term is very vague. At least some people may still have questions. So what do you mean when you talk about AI? It's a good question. And when I talk about AI, what I mean is complete systems that perceive the world digitally, that perform computation to predict the future, and then take decisions and act in the world that carry out against the predictions that the algorithms make. And it's an interesting question because when I started for the first time learning in uni, a uh, university about it in 95, the field was called artificial intelligence, like we call it now. But I sort of started at the end of what they call the second AI winter, where a lot of promises were made in the technology, not just in research, but in, in industry, that were unfulfilled. And so it became a term that you wouldn't actually actively use for a good decade of my uh, academic career, which is where we, a lot of us that worked in this field, converged more on this one very hard sub-problem of predicting the future with patterns from the past, which, uh, which we call machine learning. But for me, machine learning is a sub-discipline of artificial intelligence. And what about you? Robert Williamson, both terms artificial intelligence and machine learning are often used as a synonym. How do you define both terms? So I'm not a fan of trying to make definitions of things <laughs> that vague, because you can always find exceptions. I'd agree that machine learning is a subfield of AI. But, but look, what is AI is a moving target. Essentially, as good a definition as any is that AI is something that people are somewhat surprised and impressed that a machine does it. When the governor on a steam engine was first introduced that controlled the speed of it, this was considered pretty awesome. Likewise, an automatic garage door opener or a thermostat. Nowadays, we don't think of them as being particularly intelligent, but at the time they were introduced, they were. So it's more helpful to zero in on the more specific problems, I think, rather than the collective nouns, like predicting what the weather will be tomorrow based on a whole stack of measurements from around the world or predicting what certain people might be saying based on the previous texts that they've made. And where are we now, Mr. Herbrich? Where do we encounter AI on a daily basis? Oh, I think we encounter it pretty much every hour. So when you check the weather, that's a prediction of an algorithm that tries to forecast the future. When you look at the news, so you go and search the web or search apps in which you want to try to find what is it happened in the world. Too much happened in the world that people could literally perceive and read up or inform themselves about everything. So there's an algorithm at work that will try to predict what is relevant globally or at least or possibly to you. I think when you, you know, cars, the way they 
and you sit in a car or you sit in a bus, the train, these devices have support systems that are predicting and trying to avoid accidents and predicting what happens in the surrounding. There's many instances where it's probably not so obvious because it's no longer magic, as Bob was saying. But there's actually computation happening that, in the definition I gave, make a small forecast of what's likely to happen or could happen in the future and then take a decision or at least inform you in order to make decisions yourself and their support systems. And that's all AI, in my opinion. So that's a state of play. And Mr. Williamson, in which areas do you currently observe or predict significant progress of machine learning systems? I know that's an interesting question. It's an, and it's actually quite a contentious one within the field. It's very easy from afar to, to see these fields as somehow homogenous and that you know there must be, I don't know, 50,000 scientists around the world working on AI. But they do not all agree. Much of what goes by the name of progress in the field I'm rather skeptical of. I'll give you an example. Much of AI, in fact, like much of our modern world, is quantified in a particularly silly kind of way where you turn it into a single number, right? That you, 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 you measure the performance just by a single number on a scale zero to 100. So you can talk about, here's a prediction problem. My classifier gets it right 90% of the time. Ralph comes along with one that's accurate 91% of the time, and there's a big celebration of that fact. I would say a large fraction of current machine learning research is of that mold. Now, it's not surprising that this occurs. You see the same thing like with motor cars. You know, this motor car uses only five liters per 100 kilometer. This one uses six. Therefore, the one that uses five is somehow better. So that kind of scalarization simplifies things a lot. A more sophisticated answer is what you're seeing is this kind of universalization of machine learning that is becoming embedded into so many different areas. It's really impossible, I think, to imagine an aspect of human society where it has not already appeared or it will not appear in the near future. And you see a lot of work grappling with that, building the interfaces, right? Just because your machine learning algorithm works nicely on your data, do you trust it in your motor car? And then the final component, which is the sort of stuff that I'm interested in, is trying to get to the scientific underpinnings of what is and what is not possible. There's plenty of examples of where machine learning has worked very well indeed, but there's also lots of cases where it's really quite problematic. And being able to clearly distinguish between the two is obviously of great importance and certainly uh, an area that I'm interested in. This is a great point. Let me add an example where it's probably not so obvious. So material science, that's typically not concerned. Uh, material scientists are not concerned with AI. And in the past, they if they discover a new material, they'll physically put it together and test its properties, its stiffness, its durability. Today, a lot of it in the, in the age of simulations is happening by simulating the properties of this new material. That turns out to be very computationally intensive. So there is now a big strand where the computation of the simulation, so it's already better than having to build it, is approximated with algorithms that try to predict what the simulator would have computed in a cheaper way. And that's an area where all of a sudden material scientists really need to find an interface to leverage these AI methods for their science, for their work, to speed up and in a cost-efficient way the development of new materials, like, uh, you know, your your stiff surfaces, glass surfaces on consumer devices that we all use and cherish not to break every day. Mm -hmm. And cost efficient is a good point here. Uh, it's clear that every new application needs energy, Mr. Herbrich. Let's look into this. What is the effect of AI applications on the ecological footprint nowadays? It starts to get significant. So I'll give you a number, there's about 4% of what well, energy is used up by data centers and an increasing amount of computation in them is predictive computations that we need as an input to decision making for real world applications. And that's just counting what's in a data center. So if you add to it the energy you consume on your mobile device, on your laptop at home or on your desktop, it adds up to almost 8% of energy consumption. Not all of it is today artificial intelligence related, but a lot of our services are performing computations that are targeting and beneficial for an individual that are trying to be predictive in its nature. So at the 8% mark, it's a significant consumer of energy and it's not going to go down. Our life, our daily lives get uh, more convenient. Our industries get more efficient, more productive by the use of those methods, whether it's 
car manufacturing or, or commerce, retail commerce or fashion design, like every aspect of the industry. And so knowing that's a already leveraging, using about 8% and knowing it's going to get used more, it will become significant. And what exactly is the reason here for the high energy consumption, Mr. Williamson? Is it the training of the models? What is it exactly? The training of the model certainly is probably one of the larger consumers. The, the, the point is machine learning technology is intrinsically built upon mathematics and the mathematics that it uses when you translate it into code uses a stupendous, a truly stupendous number of computations, particularly for the large models. So to train a large natural language model must require I'm guessing the order of 10 to the 18 or so computations, a huge, huge number. And each elementary computation requires some energy. It's as simple as that, just basic arithmetic. For example, the 10 to 18 computations, if you were to take them on traditional energy sources, it translates as much CO2 footprint as a flight from Frankfurt to New York. Or well, it's actually Frankfurt to San Francisco. So it's, a, it's significant. I mean, full of passengers, not empty. So that's a one model, one language model and one application. Let's not even look at searching the parameters of that model. So in this context, there is a special responsibility for scientists to create AI algorithms that are more energy efficient? Absolutely. And as Bob was saying, part of the reason is it's today based on mathematics, deterministic mathematics, and it doesn't always map it in a way where you get the proportional good output. So one approach is that people have already shown is in a computer, we have to take a representation of numbers. We have to make them discrete. Computers are not analog. So that means we used to take a high precision because we, we didn't want to make mistakes. We used to use this software for accounting. But it turns out that if you half or even take a quarter of the bit representation, the resolution of the numbers themselves, you're not losing much in accuracy because of the nature of the computation being aggregative in many ways. So no single parameter is, is detrimental or by itself so key and so crucial for the accuracy of the prediction. So it turns out in computations where you learn to predict the future, a lower dimensional, a lower size representation is sufficient and that saves energy. But because we weren't thinking, we were merely looking at it as a mathematical problem initially when we started, the scientific community hasn't paid that much attention to how much accuracy do we really actually only need when we perform an intermediary computation for prediction? How much accuracy do we need, Mr. Williamson? Uh, just enough. <laughs> it's, well, no, it's, it's, it's hard to give an answer that's more precise than that. Figuring out how much is enough is indeed part of the problem. But look, this evolution, you see this in all other areas of technology development, right? When you start making motor cars, you don't worry too much about the emissions that they make. If there's only three cars on the road in a given town, it's a non-issue. Eventually it gets to a point where it starts to matter and you have to start paying attention to it. Then you have to start quantifying it. So that's where we are now. The positive thing is that it's in the intrinsic nature of machine learning problems that they deal with noisy measurements. And so therefore there is very good grounds to hope that you can get by with very very approximate calculations. It's a different way of thinking of what you would normally do, right? So normally you rely on computers to give you precise answers. Uh, machine learning algorithms are very robust to very crude answers. And the reason why that is, is most applications we've used so far, they look back in the past. So we wanted accuracy there, like it's history. So you're, you know, the spend that a company had in the last week, that's something that happened. We don't want that to be erroneous, but in, AI or in machine learning. It's all about predicting the future, which is uncertain by definition. We humans don't get it, right? So we have now something to trade off. We couldn't trade off an accounting error against energy consumption of a, of a financial software, but we can trade off the prediction error and maybe make 1% worse than uh, we could have with a tenth of the energy. That trade off is only possible because we talk about, we make computations for the future, not for the past. And Mr. Williamson, another concern apart from energy consumption is fairness and transparency of AI algorithms. Is that justified? Is there a real threat? Well, there's a lot hidden in those words. So all technologies cause harms, and usually they cause harms that people don't even notice at first. And 
So fairness harms are to do with you apply a machine learning algorithm to data about people and certain groups of people end up being hard done by. Now, there's no doubt that such fairness harms arise and they can be made worse by using machine learning algorithms. Conversely, it's also true that you have such harms even without computers at all. Modern bureaucracies effectively computers. Max Weber, early theorist of bureaucracies, talked about the calculative rules of a bureaucracy, right? In the individual bureaucrats are just little cogs in a machine. And they follow the script, they follow the rules, and they say that, no, you're not eligible for this social benefit. So on the one hand, you know, I understand that there is a lot of anxiety that machines come into the picture and they're kind of, they're cold and they're calculating, but then so are bureaucracies. The one thing, the one upside with machines is that in principle, right, if you have the right mindset, you can audit them very well indeed. If you go and ask a bureaucrat, why did you make this decision? Uh, we, we don't even know our own reasons. Like, why did you choose to have a hamburger yesterday for lunch? You don't know why, right? Um, whereas with a computer, it's all there in a log file. So in principle, you can go and audit it if you start to take care about it. And so people are taking care of these things. But I would like to add one other thing. So it's a common thing that when new technologies come along, you do see these problems. And people ascribe the harms directly to the technology. When you step back a little bit, you realize it's never the technology itself that causes the harm. It's the way it gets used. So think of the technology of steel, right? Steel is an alloy made from iron and carbon and a few other things. It's non-trivial to make. It's great material. You can use it for all sorts of things. You can make a baby's pram or you can make a gun. Mm -hmm. So is steel technology good or bad? Right. So it's exactly the same with AI. And I think there's all sorts of reasons you might speculate as to why this is. But much of the debate has focused upon whether the technology is good or bad and how to fix the technology. My view is far more attention needs to be paid to the particular uses of the technology and asking the usual political questions. Right. Who has power? What are they trying to achieve? What are they trying to do to other people? And then then technology is just the mediator. And you're starting to see scholarship along these lines, which is a positive sign. And for the future of AI, is it important that it gets democratized? Well, you ask a, who has the power? Ah, uh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, exactly the same with all other technologies. So information technologies in general, this is particularly pertinent, right? So the technology of media, you can have electronic media, and we have had it for a long time without any AI or machine learning, for sure. And this is why many countries have media ownership laws to avoid the concentration of power, the concentration of ownership for that reason. So with regard to AI, it's not a question so much of who owns the algorithms per se, it's much more an instance of the algorithm running, the entire system, right? The data center, the algorithm, the data sources, the customers or the people involved, who's in charge? And when you pose the question that way, you really do see that the, the, the technology of machine learning, it's just a mediator. It, 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 it has a big effect, but it's not the main game. And Mr. Herbert, talking about power and humans, many people are concerned about the challenges facing humanity right now, especially climate change. This is the other side of the story. AI systems can play a vital role in achieving climate goals. In what way? Good question, because not only is it a consumer, but it's also helping in storage and the marketplace of energy. So good news today, every day, about at least 200 times the amount of energy we need as a society, as a worldwide society, arrives in the form of solar power from sun. So we, in principle, have enough. But like with anything that's available, it isn't always at the right time and at the right place. So the distribution for the marketplace plays a big role. If you want to have energy in the night, well, you need to have stored it somewhere to use it. If you want to have it, but you happen to be not directly facing, so you're living more north or more south, you need to store it. And part of where I think I can help a great deal is managing that marketplace in terms of technologies for the storage. So... We call them generally batteries, and there's electric batteries, there's gravitational batteries. Um, all of them 
as apparatus themselves are difficult physical systems to understand them well so to last them longer is something where algorithms can help i mean as much as a battery is a solution for the distribution problem, the production of it is also initially a problem because every battery has a very negative footprint the day it gets produced. And then over time, as it gets charged with renewable energy, its footprint gets less and less negative. And after about 700 charges for a typical battery, it's break even. So the longer it lasts, the more net positive it ends up being. And so algorithms that detect, for example, what's the inner degradation of a battery and instead of what typically has been done in the past to open them up after which they're destroyed they're useful because they allow us to scale that technology i talked about material science one of the key reasons why we actually can use batteries now for mobile devices like cars or, or scooters or, or bikes is because the density of the energy per kilogram weight is high enough. So it pays to store one kilowatt hour. If you then have to carry that energy itself, the storage mechanism, you can even carry a passenger on a bike or two passengers or four passengers in a car. That's a result of material science, discovering material property of lithium that are deployed in lithium ion batteries, but we're not at the end of that. So more and more material science is needed to get us denser batteries, which would itself make it more uh, from an ecological footprint, a lot better to have them as storage mechanisms for appliances everywhere. And that's where AI will actually save us costs and speed up the research to discover them. And then I said 8% for all digital technology, but the by far two biggest consumers of worldwide energy today are transportation and residential homes. So in transportation, we've made great progress with the cars and you know with those cars, uh, you need the safety in driving, but also in operating them. In homes, we're still relying predominantly on switches and thermostats. Very few homes adopt to their people, their inhabitants living there in actively saving energy. So at times of the day where you don't need the heat in a certain part or you don't need the light in a certain part. And that's an area where algorithms can help a great deal to make our homes smarter and therefore let more energy efficient without impacting our way of living. And Mr. Williamson, what's your perspective on this? Where do you see the largest potential of artificial intelligence for tackling climate change? Most difficult problems don't have a single thing that you can do to solve them. If they did, they wouldn't be difficult problems. It's actually a pretty good definition of a difficult problem. So I think, you know, there's a panoply of places that you can apply this. Um, a few years ago, I supervised a PhD thesis predicting where the clouds will be. Now, 20 years ago, this would have seemed a rather strange project to have, like sometimes it's cloudy, sometimes it's not, you might want to know that, but predicting them really precisely, why would you want to do that? Because then you can predict the output of rooftop solar photovoltaics across a city. And why do you need to do that? Because as Ralph alluded to, one of the challenges with providing energy for the world is not that there's not enough of it, it's in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so you need to go and store it. So managing that is a, is a challenge. You could probably rattle off you know, 10 or 20 other areas where you can apply the technology of AI, and which one ends up being the most important, you'll only know when you've tried it out. It's the nature of the problem. If you could work it out in advance, you'd go and put all of your effort into that. So it's a fine thing that many people are looking at this in a, in, a, in a multitude of ways, just like all other technological problems that we've ever faced. And then there will be solutions, but we just don't know what they are yet. But that's why it's so important. I think, I mean, research has the, that we do broad range of research on it. I think it's not about producing one wonder tech that you deploy and then all of a sudden all is good. And research has it in its nature. There will be some failures along the way, but we'll, we'll need to try them all out. And you are the chair of the newly established department for AI and sustainability. What are your goals? How do you want to bring both fields together here? Well, I think uh, as a chair for an institute is to help grow the next level of leaders as academics themselves that cover a lot of the ideas and work out if they do work or not but also founders that take their idea, found a company maybe in for more circular, more longer lasting battery technology for trustable 
trustworthy tech in a smart home that you are happily deploying in your home and feeling the privacy is, is, is guaranteed. So my goal is really to, to build that new next level of scientific and industrial leaders. So, and what excites you the most, Mr. Williamson, when you talk about AI and machine learning? So at the moment, what excites me at most mm -hmm. is excavating the foundations. So I don't know, it's a peculiarity of some scientists that rather than looking at the shiny building, you pay attention to the hole in the ground that it was dug in. So machine learning uses the raw material of data. And there are theories of data that machine learning has appropriated from a long time ago, probability and statistics. And so what I'm excited about at the moment is examining the basis of that very, very closely to understand how one might change what one does in machine learning. A very concrete example, which is simple enough to understand. One of the simplest things that you might do when given a stack of numbers is to take the average. And we do this intuitively to, I don't know, we average out the noise. It sort of you know, factors out inconsequential variations. Now you ask yourself, why the average? What other things might you do? This turns out to be a remarkably fertile question to pursue with all sorts of other connections, and it goes to the foundations of probability theory. And then one can connect it back to state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms. So motivated by understanding what machine learning algorithms do, and in fact motivated by questions of fairness, like which you alluded to earlier, takes me to these foundational questions in mathematics, which is a lot of fun. So that's what I'm spending my time doing. Maybe I want to add one thing that Bob and I are looking at because it's probably easy to understand as it's so foundational and maybe we're on a path to nowhere or maybe we're on a path to somewhere, which is the simplest thing you learn in the first grade is adding numbers, small numbers, you know, one plus three. So every school child tells you that's four. So one of the ways that we're looking at is given there is uncertainty in the prediction, what happens if you use unreliable compute units Today we don't, so today every computer will always tell you for it. But what if we actually reduce, let's say, voltage so heavily on a chip that it makes mistakes so that it doesn't, one plus four can end up being five or six or even eight, of course, with smaller probability. But how would you perform, how would you build an algorithm on a piece of computation that is no longer accurate in adding two numbers? Seems a, as I said, seems a very easy to understand problem. Naturally, you wouldn't look at it because why would a computer need to make mistakes that can't be good? But maybe that's one of the keys to unlock energy aware AI. Fascinating insights. Thank you both for this discussion. Robert Williamson, Professor for Foundations of Machine Learning Systems at the Eberhard Karls University Tübingen. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And Professor Ralf Herbrich, Managing Director of the Hasso Plattner Institute and Chair of the Department for AI and Sustainability. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. And that was a lot of fun. And my name is Leon Stiebe. Thank you for listening. Please tune in next time. Till then, tschüss and bye bye. Digitales Wissen verständlich auf den Punkt gibt es bei Neuland, dem Wissenspodcast des Hasso Plattner Instituts.